So hi everyone, thanks for coming to the Regain Technical Expert Office Hours today. I'm Tracy Bulandi and I'm a program associate with the Wallace Center um, and the Pasture Project. And um, today we are conducting our Technical Expert Office Hours um, where we feature a technical expert working in regenerative agriculture um, so they can share their experience and have um, share their experiences, their work and research um, and allow our Regain members to ask any questions um, and have a learning opportunity. So just a little bit of background on what Regain is. Uh, it is the Regenerative Ag Idea Network. And this is a partner and member driven online community of practice that is designed for all regenerative agriculture educators, advocates, leaders, practitioners um, to discuss challenges, share successes, um, access ex expertise and share resources. Uh, it's primarily focused in the upper Midwest, but um, we're also hoping to expand that membership across the country. Um, Regain is a racial equity focused platform um, where we ensure that we're supporting regenerative, regenerative agriculture efforts that honor and integrate indigenous knowledge, practices and leadership, academic research and technology um, to ensure that we're really providing equitable participation and empowerment for all peoples. Today we have Randy Jackson, Professor of Grassland Ecology at UW-Madison with the Department of Agronomy and with Grassland 2.0. And with that, I'll actually just um, let you take it away. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks for the opportunity. It's a, a small but important group of folks here. And uh, to Aaron's point about uh, hearing more about grassland and hearing about what we're doing, uh, a big part of this is me trying to figure out, us trying to figure out what Grassland 2.0 is all about and what we're doing. So uh, welcome some conversation about that and ideas uh, uh, and input and that sort of thing as we go. I'm going to try not to talk too long. I'll just talk about two um, main things. One is the soil carbon work that um, people in my group have been doing over the last um, oh, decade or so and um, talk about the implications of that soil carbon work for what we call regenerative agriculture. And, you know, we can have some discussion about what is it that we call regenerative ag. I don't mean to take us down a rabbit hole of definitions necessarily, but I think conceptually it is important for us to kind of have some shared understanding about what regenerative ag is, lest, oh, lots of resources get diverted to things that aren't truly regenerative. And so we can have that conversation if you like. Um, and then all of that would be a segue into Grassland 2.0, which is this USDA project that, that several of you are, are part of and uh, that we're trying to figure out what, what we're doing. So love to talk about all that. I'm going to share my string, screen here and um, I've, I've borrowed a few slides uh, from recent talks. So apologies if you've seen some of these. Uh, hopefully you haven't seen all of them. I first want to acknowledge uh, that most of the work I'm going to talk about, most of the data I'm going to talk about, has been hard fought and hard won uh, by folks uh, who get their boots dirty on a daily basis, not me. Um, and that's Greg Sanford, who's a research scientist at UW-Madison. And I've been working with Greg for uh, many years now. He runs the Wisconsin Integrated Cropping Systems Trial, WIXT, which I'm going to talk more about. Ashley Becker is a current master's student, and uh, she's going to defend her thesis Friday at Grassland 2.0's Meta Lab meeting, which I'm happy to share a link with. Or if you want uh, to email me, I can send you a link to that talk. Uh, it should be exciting and fun, although I guess I'm going to maybe uh, scoop her a little bit today, but she'll, she'll explain it much better than I do. Dr. Yi Chao Rui is the research director of the Farming Systems Trial at the Rodale Institute did his postdoc working at Wixt in Southern Wisconsin, working with Matt Ruark uh, and uh, Yi Chao. Um, his work is really looking at the mechanisms of carbon change. I'm not gonna dive into that, uh, I, but I left him up here because uh, if we have conversation about like, why are we seeing what we see? 
uh, his work can be uh, very useful to help us understand some of it. And then finally, Tracy Campbell's a, a grad student uh, working with Chris Kucharek, and she's done a lot of modeling work um, of carbon and nutrient dynamics. So I just wanted to make sure that I pointed out that the work I'm going to talk about is primarily theirs. Um, so when we think about what is regenerative ag, I know that we've all heard and read about what it is and what it isn't, et cetera. I tend to um, gravitate towards a fairly, I guess, rigid uh, um, uh, opinion about this. I feel like regenerative ag should be at its very fundamental level, um, putting back more than it takes. To me, that's what regenerative means. And, and fundamentally, I think organic matter or carbon are the sort of the, the main common denominator that we should be looking at, but not the only one. So I just want to make it really clear. And that's a big part of what makes people nervous, I think, with uh, oh, carbon markets and that sort of thing, is that we'll become so myopically focused on carbon that we forget about eutrophication of waterways with nutrients and biodiversity and, and, and community health and, uh, and well-being and uh, social justice and, and equity issues, et cetera. And we can't ignore those things. Those things have to be baked into regenerative ag. But fundamentally, if you're not putting back more carbon than you're taking, uh, to me, it's not going to be, it shouldn't be considered regenerative ag. So why do we need to put more carbon back? This sketch is fairly complicated. I like it because of the red font. And so the red font uh, shows us basically the human driven elements of the carbon cycle, the global carbon cycle. Uh, so we're combusting fossil fuels uh, and putting them into the atmosphere at the rate of nine petagrams of carbon per year. And just for context, I was like, uh, who knows what a petagram is? I don't know what it is. It's, it's this many one quadrillion grams of carbon. So that's how much we put into the atmosphere every year uh, from fossil fuel and land use change. And then as a result of the way we've manipulated our environment, we've stimulated photosynthesis about three petagrams uh, in terrestrial environment and about two petagrams in the ocean uh, environment. And so the difference, of course, is um, nine minus five, and that's four, and that's the atmospheric increase of carbon in the atmosphere every year that's driving climate change. So that's the kind of the nut that we're trying to crack when it comes to trying to stabilize climate. And I think when we talk about regenerative ag, a big part of that conversation is how can we, can we use our ag systems to, our ag soils to help stabilize? Certainly it won't be the whole answer. It can't be the whole answer. The math doesn't add up, but can we use it to help uh, stabilize atmosphere, uh, excuse me, to help stabilize climate? So keeping that number of uh, four pentagrams per year in mind. Um, folks have done, you know, folks who are, have way bigger brains than I do have done all these calculations to look at what might be possible, uh, looking at sort of improved management of forests and crops and grazing lands. And you can just see here the order of magnitude for the estimates of what's possible. Uh, you know, if we sum all of these up, then we're getting pretty close to that four pentagram. So uh, I think that this gives folks a lot of hope that changing land use might be a big part of the solution. Of course, also working against us is our continued land use change. So think biomass, uh, sorry, think uh, rainforest uh, cutting down in the, cut, sorry, what do we call that? Uh, cutting down the rainforest in the Amazon and whatnot and converting it into pasture. Uh, that's the, the kind of thing that would fall under this human land use. And then the permafrost sea is a big issue because, of course, this is a feedback from the changing climate to uh, the soils in the uh, polar regions. And this make, is a very scary story because it says that the more we stimulate the climate and increase the temperature, the more we're going to stimulate the climate and increase the temperature. And um, I think a part of the story that we're starting to crack open in the terrestrial environment, I'm sorry, in temperate systems, um, in agricultural systems might be related to this uh, in a really unsettling way. So 
um, just to kind of ground us here, this is, I've done some back of the envelope calculations, if you will, to kind of, again, for that context, because like, who knows what a pedogram is. Um, if we look across these land uses and the amount of area there is, et cetera, you know, like what kind of gains would we need to realize, say, uh, you know, 0.5 pedograms of carbon per year? And th those numbers turn out to be highly variable for, you know, because different environments are, diff are, are more or less productive and there's more or less land, et cetera. But really we're looking at sort of improving carbon gains uh, to the tune of 10 to 70 grams of carbon per meter squared per year. And so just for context, I've drawn what looks to me to be roughly about a meter squared here uh, off behind Greg, you know, so Greg's standing here showing us a, these beautiful mollusol soils and, and the Arlington Prairie. Uh, and I, just for context, here's about a meter squared uh, of land behind him. And so if we look at that pile of soil in Greg's hand, which is not a lot, uh, that might be about 20 grams. I didn't weigh it. I'm just guessing that's about 20 grams of soil in his hand. And um, a very generous proportion of soil uh, as carbon would be about two and a half percent maybe 3% would be a super generous amount, but most of our ag soils have less than 3% uh, carbon. So in his hand, he's got about a half a gram of carbon. Yeah. So that's not a lot of carbon uh, and we need to increase our um, system 10 to 70 grams of carbon per meter squared. So what that's telling me, if I did my calculations right, is that Greg needs to spread 20 to 140 handfuls of soil in that meter squared area every year in order to crack this uh, gain of carbon. That's a lot of soil. I mean, that's 20 grams in his hand is not particularly a lot, but if he did 20 or if he did 140 of them, that's a lot of soil to add to that meter squared. Anyway, just for context, and, and here's for more context, like. Uh, really aggressive background soil formation estimates, which would be, you know, the result of rock weathering and inputs of carbon and churning of soil, et cetera, might be one to five grams of carbon per meter squared per year. So it's a, it's not a trivial task here trying to build the carbon in our agricultural soils. And so let's talk more about that if we can. We'll use this Wisconsin Integrated Cropping Systems trial, which was started by Josh Posner, who is a professor in the Department of Agronomy, who passed away seven or eight years ago, and he started WIXT uh, on the Arlington Prairie. This was the Empire Prairie. It's, the, I think, the biggest contiguous unit of prairie in southern Wisconsin, pre-European uh, contact. And Janet uh, Hedke ran this trial for many years. It's, it's now 32 years old. He started it in 1989, 31, 32 years old. Greg was his PhD student. And so the work I'm about to share was the work that Greg did for his PhD, uh, uh, working with Josh at the WIXT uh, trial. It's located here in South Central Ar uh, Wisconsin at the Arlington Ag Research Station. So uh, what's cool about WIXT, one of the things that's cool about WIXT is um, there are sort of two main types of cropping systems that we compare. There are cash grain systems, so corn or corn in rotation with soybeans or corn in rotation with soybeans, uh, but with a wheat clover kind of cover crop in between the corn and the soybeans. And this system, it's, it's um, gold here because it's organic. So we manage that system organically. And then three dairy forage systems here, corn followed by three years of alfalfa. I should say over here on the left-hand side, these systems are managed as high, in, high input, sort of conventional, typical cropping systems. So the best improved genetics every year, uh, lots of uh, Roundup, lots of uh, pesticides, lots of herbicides, whatever it takes, fertilizer. Uh, and then we have this organic corn alfalfa rotation where we have oats as a cover crop. And then we have a cool season grassland rotational grazing uh, plot, more than one plot. There's four replications of each one of these treatments and each phase of each treatment is in the ground every year, which really blows up the number of overall plots we have. So we have 
for this treatment, corn soybean rotation, we have eight plots to have four reps of each phase every year and so on. So it's a monster to, it's a beast that we continue to look for resources to feed and uh, keep alive, but it's a really super, uh, super important and valuable uh, experiment. The problem is the longer it stays around, the more valuable it gets and the harder it gets to fund it. But, you know, we can talk about that some other time. So one of the cool things about it is it has allowed us to take deep cores. The soils are about a meter deep on top of glacial till. And in 1989, they took deep cores and estimated the total amount of carbon across the entire soil profile. And then in 2009, Greg did the same thing for his PhD work. By the by, in 2019, we did it again and we're still processing those cores. I don't have the data to share with you today. Stay tuned, uh, maybe in six months, we'll have this, the next phase of the story. Um, but uh, the, the, the deep coring uh, is important because um, most of the soil carbon work that you hear about in the literature is focused on surface soils. Not all of it, but by and large, most of it is focused on surface soil. So here's Greg's results. Um, it was grim. All of the annual cropping systems were losing uh, a significant amount of soil carbon across a 20 year period. So this is the change in soil carbon in megagrams per hectare over a 20 year period. And so you might recall that we're trying to gain 10 to 70 grams of carbon per meter square per year. And if you uh, do the math on this, we're losing about 25 grams of carbon per meter square per year. Whether it was high input, continuous corn, whether it was organic corn, soy, wheat rotation with cover crops, whether it was organic corn with organic alfalfa, all of these systems were losing carbon to a significant degree, except the pastures, the cool season pasture that was grazed, which neither gained nor lost in a significant way. I mean, if you look at the air bar, it overlaps zero. So we say statistically not significant from zero. Now, what's important is that if we had, this is across the entire one meter depth. If we had only looked at the surface soils, pastures would have been gaining a lot of carbon. I could dig down and give you the data on that, but they'd be gaining a lot. And some of these other systems also would have been gaining carbon because some of them did gain carbon in the surface uh, horizons. But when we look across the entire depth, um, they certainly were, were losing. So um, again, I've come back to this just for context. I think I've basically said what this is saying, which is that uh, we got a lot of work to do here. In the meantime, there's been a lot of data, a lot of results recently from um, really good studies looking at managed grazing and estimating soil carbon accumulation under managed grazing. And so with the context we have in mind now, I just want us to stare hard at these numbers and think about um, the likelihood that these kind of numbers are actually being realized. So some of these studies have reported up to 800 grams of carbon per meter squared per year. That's 400 to 1600 handfuls of soil in that meter squared area every year. That's a lot of carbon. That's a lot of handfuls of soil. For context, again, I'm big on this context here. Here's a picture I scraped out of a publication of eight megagrams per hectare of biomass, which is, that's, uh, that would be 860 grams of, uh, of biomass per meter squared. So basically we're saying this much carbon accumulating in the soil every year. It just seems hard to imagine. I'm not picking on those particular studies. I, I think that they probably are the result of a focus on surface soil and on a focus on some methodological approaches that are maybe a little bit questionable. Well, I know that they're questionable. It's been questioned in the literature significantly. So uh, in the meantime, uh, we also have been looking at soil loss. Uh, Janet uh, ran Russell 2. Uh, this is several years ago now and looked at what Russell 2 would predict for soil loss from uh, the WIXT experiments. And so you can see here that I've taken her estimates of in tons per acre and calculated 
what that would mean in terms of soil carbon. And so she looked at the continuous corn that was losing about nine grams of carbon per meter squared per year. So not only were we losing carbon as a concentration in the soil, we were losing that much, if you believe the Russell 2, we were losing another nine grams of carbon per meter squared just due to erosion. Look at the organic systems, uh, 22 grams of carbon and 16 grams of carbon per meter squared. Uh, about one, it was actually a little bit less than one gram of carbon per meter squared in the pasture predicted to be lost. Again, just for context, we're trying to gain 10 to 70 grams and yet we're losing this much just to erosion. Um, it doesn't really add up. And one of the reasons this is really difficult is that soil organic carbon accumulation, sequestration, soil carbon building is precarious, it's tricky business. It's the balance of carbon coming into the system as plant growth, what we sometimes we might call it NPP, net primary productivity. It's root growth, above ground growth, all that carbon that's coming into the system, minus all the carbon that's leaving the system due to microbial activity, microbial respiration. And those two arrows, the inputs of plant growth and the outputs of microbial respiration, are actually depicted on this plot. But what's what this plot is, is the actual carbon measurements above the plant canopy. And so we get the gains as MPP on these top uh, circles, and we get the losses as microbial respiration or heterotrophic respiration on the bottom here. And again, this is a busy slide, so let me just say that uh, the, whether they're colored in or not is whether or not it was cool season grassland or alfalfa, which the dynamics are basically the same. So what we see is that if we take the inputs, which are the gains, the MPP, minus the outputs, we get the net carbon balance for the year, you know, integrated over this, this year-long period. There's this very brief period of time, we happen to be in it right now, um, where the NPP is actually greater than the soil carbon loss due to microbial respiration. It's this period of rapid growth and uptake in the spring and early summer. There's maybe a, a bit of that in the in fall, especially in our cool season pastures. But by and large, microbial respiration is outstripping uptake by the plants. Now look, over a millennial scale or decadal scales, soils accumulate in prairies, right? So we know that at that scale, the MPP wins. But over maybe the last five years, the last 10 years, it's not uh, um, unthinkable that the microbes are winning. And in fact, if there's something that's driving and stimulating the microbes preferentially, then that really bodes ill for our ability to hold on to carbon in the soil. It's essentially the permafrost story in uh, polar regions. And so what we know from Chris Kucharik's modeling and empirical work is that over the last 50 years, our climate is getting warmer, especially in the springtime, especially at night, and especially in the winter. I misspoke. Let me back up. It's getting warmer, especially in the winter and especially at night. I, I said springtime because I was staring at this plot. So it's getting warmer at period, in periods of the day and periods of the season when there's virtually no NPP. So we're stimulating microbial activity, but without a concomitant stimulation of plant growth. Scary stuff. And to me, um, makes us think hard about our ability to accumulate carbon in the soil. Okay, so I've said all that. Let me transition to this work that Ashley Becker has been doing. So Ashley started her master's degree a, a year and a half or so ago, and she went out to about 30 sites in Wisconsin um, wanting to quantify soil carbon under graze systems, but then she was trying to pair that with a nearby site that was in an annual cropping system. And then she did all kinds of diligence, all kinds of hard work to uh, convince herself 
and ultimately, hopefully, the reviewers of her manuscript, that these paired comparisons were reasonable comparisons of land use change. In other words, she worked really hard to make sure that they were on the same soil type and that they were the same soil texture, reasonably the same soil texture, that they weren't on different positions in the landscape, et cetera, et cetera. She talked to the owners and got, you know, dug into their records. And so she had this beautiful data set of about 30 sites where she has a cool season grassland comparison with a annual uh, cropping system. And she looked at two different depths. So the zero to 15 centimeter depth and also the 15 to 30 centimeter depth. And her one of her limitations was that she would only go to a site and sample it if it had been in pasture for at least three years. So I'll, here's the part where I scoop her a little bit, but you can listen more to her talk on Friday. Um, what she found is that in the 15 centimeter surface soils, um, there was vastly more soil carbon in the pastures than in the annual cropping system. So this is the, uh, the difference in soil carbon between the pasture and the crop field. At the 15 to 30 centimeter depth, there were no differences. So she takes this as support for the idea that these pairs were pretty good. They probably were similar soils to begin with, and now the grazing is having an impact on uh, the surface soils. This is another way of looking at the same data, but on a farm by farm basis. So each one of these dots is a farm. And what you can see is that there actually were five uh, or six farms that had more carbon in the annual cropping system than the pasture. Yeah, it's not just like plant the pasture and that's it, it's a done deal. Uh, and so she's currently, you know, for her PhD work, she's gonna dig more into this. Uh, what is it about these sites that uh, they had more carbon than the pasture, uh, et cetera. She's gonna dig, dig into these data in a lot uh, of different ways and expand her research for her PhD. One of the most interesting things, though, is that if she looked at the age of her pastures, there's a pretty, uh, pretty strong, reasonably strong for ecological work uh, relationship between the age of the pasture and how much carbon there was in the soil. And in fact, if we look at the slope, uh, it's about 32 grams of carbon per meter squared per year. Remember, we're trying to hit that 10 to 70 grams of carbon per meter squared per year. So a, a reasonable, kind of slow, but reasonable carbon accumulation under the pastures, if you believe this so-called space for time substitution approach. And her next steps are to, con and what she'll talk more about Friday is that she took that soil carbon and broke it into particulate organic matter and mineral associated organic matter, which is shown here, and looked at those carbon ratios and, and uh, that tells her a lot about uh, what she's seeing. So. Stay tuned for that on Friday. Finally, uh, last bit of data that I'll talk about here. Um, Tracy Campbell did this modeling work, uh, uh, ecosystem modeling, not, uh, not closed modeling or anything like that, ecosystem modeling work, um, where she looked at the Yahara River watershed uh, and they have this total maximum daily load goal of reducing uh, the amount of phosphorus going into the waterways by by 2050. And um, the number is something like 122,000 pounds of phosphorus a year. And she asked uh, with models, uh, how can we actually crack that nut? How can we get to 122,000 pounds of phosphorus per year, per year? And the takeaway message is, and this work's just now been accepted in ecosystems uh, and it'll be out soon, is that the only way to do it in the next 50 years is to, sorry, the only way to do it by 2050, the next 30 years, is to reduce the number of animal units in the watershed by half, or to add 50% perennial grass to the agricultural landscape in that watershed. Both would be great, but um, these are the only ways that she could make the model converge on meeting the EPA TMDL goals. And so really it was this work coupled with Greg's work and now Ashley's work that for me uh, and, and a lot of my colleagues got us talking about this thing called Grassland 2.0, which is to say, we've got to stop talking about 
incremental change that might or might not work. We've got to at least articulate a vision for what might be possible on the landscape. And if that vision is not economically viable, then we need to start talking about how to make it so. Uh, and so that's, you know, policy and markets, et cetera. And uh, as we started to develop our vision for this Grassland 2.0 project, it was really emerging from, these, from this work. We've got to move from a dominant annual crop system that has some perennials sort of on the margins to a system that where the matrix is perennial grassland, perennial vegetation. And, you know, we're not dogmatic about this, like we can't have any annuals. We have to grow some grain, we have to grow vegetables, et cetera. But uh, that should be done, we think, in, in ways that are more benign uh, and, and ultimately more healthy for people and communities uh, over time. So uh, here's my summary slide. I, I'm not gonna walk through all what it says here. I think um, you get the message. Uh, I like to show this picture because here's Greg. Uh, he promises that if we can't make the ag systems accumulate carbon via MPP, then he'll just uh, breathe CO2 into the soils and try and build it up that way. Anyway, Grassland 2.0 is this uh, collaboration. Uh, UW-Madison is sort of the home base for it, but uh, lots of partners from University of Minnesota and Croatan Institute, Grassworks, Aaron's on the call, Greenland's Blue Waters, Pasture Project, on and on. But the idea is that this NASCAR slide continues to grow and that we add uh, people to the conversation. And then really importantly, like I can't say this strongly enough, uh, Grassland 2.0 is not meant to sort of co-opt uh, all the important uh, work that's been going on in these organizations over the years. It's to try and find ways to support it, stimulate it, um, accelerate it if we can, but to crack up, but always with an eye to cracking open this vision for like a transformed landscape. Like what, what would it really look like if it was completely transformed? Um, and so that's that's our main uh, the main point of the Grassland 2.0 project. Uh, to us, that's you know sort of grounded in uh, the words of Leopold, which were uh, in my mind he was channeling um, indigenous folks and and lots of other folks who over time talk about uh, this identity that caring for the land is caring for ourselves that we can't get away from, and that when we do get away from it, when we think that we sort of put ourselves outside of the system. Um, that's when we go wrong and we have to think of ourselves as part of the system and we have to take care of that system so that we can uh, indeed take care of ourselves. So let me just walk through quickly here the what we call the theory of change for Grassland 2.0, the overall theory of change for the project. If we're, we we want to paint a vision and this is something that we're not, I mean, we've kind of just gotten started with this and uh, we look for help on this. Um, we want to paint a vision of a picture of healthy ecosystems and vital thriving communities and, and ultimately individuals who are engaged in what we might call collaborative landscape management, where people are coming together to think about how to weave together and stitch together landscapes, biophysical landscapes, as well as economic and market and supply chain, where people are stitching that together and managing it in collaborative ways. Stakeholders are coming together and doing that. But of course, we have this current system that is depicted here uh, where these gears grinding on each other and grinding down on people. Uh, and those gears are really, you know, you can put lots of words in here, but to me, like the main problem, the main reason we have so-called lock-in that won't let us move from this system to another system uh, is uh, very much related to the concept of productivism. Uh, when you go out and have conversations with, say, farmers or agency folks, many of them, not all of them, but many of them are like, yep, I agree with you, but uh, how do I make money? How do I make money? How do I make money? Right now, the system is based on produce more, produce more, produce more. That's how you make money. We've got to find a way to move away from uh, that productivism and that focus on efficiency that says, as long as I'm producing a lot, everything else be damned. Um, of course, institutions like the one that I'm uh, sitting in and uh, uh, waving my arms and yammering uh, are uh, have a lot of um, skin in the game with respect to this existing 
power structure, academia, and social norms, et cetera. So all of these things have to be, this is all just to say that all of these things have to be considered as we think about how to make transformative change. And here I've listed some of the negative outcomes of the current system. So what we've talked about in Grassland 2.0 so far is that in order to crack this lock-in nut, we need top-down and bottom-up pressure simultaneously exerted on the system. And our, uh, the th here are sort of the things that we are working on uh, collaboratively. This is all about collaborative partnerships. So working with Greenlands Blue Waters and Pasture Project and, and others uh, to just get the stories out there and raise awareness. Uh, to paint pictures of what's healthy soil and clean water and biodiverse landscapes look like. Uh, to uh, raise awareness and, and paint a picture of what an equitable, diverse, inclusive, uh, just system would look like. And then to articulate the kinds of pulls and pushes in terms of markets and policies that are going to be necessary to make this transformation happen. Because it's not going to happen if people aren't going to be able to make money at it. And it's not going to happen if we don't have policies that reframe the bounds of the game so that people can make money in a way that actually is providing healthy ecosystems for folks. We hope that by doing all these things, uh, by working with others to raise awareness and, and demonstrate all these things, that we can generate societal demand that overwhelms the resistance that is inevitable, that's occurring now, that um, is, is lurking, it's in your face. I know all of you have probably dealt with this on a daily basis. There's pushback, there's resistance because it's a lot easier to stay in the status quo or because people are benefiting from the status quo, but we have to find out what, figure out ways to overcome that. Then we have this bottom up uh, focus, which is uh, a, a, about a process of collaborative landscape design. And this is where we get together in learning hubs what we have been calling learning hubs, to work with groups of stakeholders, uh, largely folks who have already begun conversations around making change. And the idea from our perspective of these learning hubs is that these are places where we can bring some of the tools that folks in the university have developed or folks in the marketplace have developed, uh, folks in government have developed, where we can bring them to bear on these conversations in a kind of coordinated and coherent way. I mean, we're just co-opting what the Pasture Project's been doing already in a lot of places in a lot of ways, but trying to infuse that with more energy. Our collaborative landscape design process is largely about trying to bring people together and connect people. And I'll just say that this has been surprisingly to me, and maybe it shouldn't have been surprising. Um, bringing people together around conversations is tricky business and hard work. And uh, I'm looking at Pete when I say this, because I, I, I can hear his voice saying, well, yeah, we've been doing this for a long time and it's hard work. You got to roll up your sleeves. And, um, you know, it's about trust building and buy-in and careful, slow walking and deliberative conversations. And that's hard work. And in a lot of cases, the connections used to exist and have been broken. And so there's uh, acrimony in a lot of places and a lot of conversations. And so figuring out how to bring people together is a huge part of this. What we want to do ultimately is bring them together in ways that we can envision novel landscapes. Again, this is not just the biophysical landscape, but also um, supply chains. And then uh, uh, one of the things the Wallace Center has been really leading on is helping us develop, uh, helping to develop uh, a tool called Grayscape, which is a tool that helps farmers uh, plan their individual enterprises. So maybe you're in a discussion here where you're talking about supply chains and novel landscapes and you're thinking, well, that's great, but how am I going to pencil that out? Uh, so uh, a lot of good work going on in this realm. And then finally, we're going to need the kind of policies uh, to incentivize and support change. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is build what we call an agroecological transformation plan. We're trying to build a plan for the entire upper Midwest. And that plan is uh, supposed to be informed by agroecological transformation plans that develop and emerge within these learning hubs. And then finally, we, we really hope that the whole concept of learning hubs 
expands and spreads, again, to help overcome the resistance to get people excited about what's possible. The more demonstration there is of it, the more likely it is to happen again. Um, so there's a lot of trust in uh, assuming that things will happen, but uh, I think the more we push on this, the, the more likely it is to happen. So that's sort of the overall picture for the Grassland 2.0 project. And I'm looking at the time and I wanna make sure that we leave the rest of the time for questions and conversations. So I'm gonna stop. Thanks for indulging me. Yeah, thank you for that, Randy. That was very thorough, very informative. Um, and yeah, if others have questions, feel free to put them into the chat or just unmute yourself. Um, we have a couple minutes for questions. Yeah, I have a question for you, Randy. Thanks for, that was great. I, I think I've heard some of that, but some of that's uh, new and I really appreciate how you explained it. Um, I am just curious about, you know, I, I think um, what my uninformed or limited knowledge tells me is that, um, you know, uh, ripping up pasture, tillage, all that can really kind of set back, um, <laughs> you know, years and years and years of progress and just looking at where things are, the volatility and some of the, um, you know, corn futures and where things are going up and down and, and all of that. Um, you know, it seems like part of this is how to grow grassland acres, but also sustain them in that kind of, um, you know, as crop prices go up. And we've heard those stories of when prices are down, grassland acres go up. And when prices are up, acres go down and and also knowing that that's increasingly in a global world you know market where um <laughs> you know it's not just about preserving grasslands here but it's also about what do we what does that mean for other parts of the world um as we convert you know to more perennialized systems um so i'm just curious about how you see that um, i know it's a kind of a big sticky question that if you knew the answer to you could <laughs> you know run the world um but i am just curious about like that durability question um in so that we just don't see we've heard about it even just this year of yeah. um pasture acres getting ripped up and put into corn yeah it is a sticky sticky wicket isn't it um we can you can leave land in pasture for 10 15 years and likely uh you know liberate all the carbon you accumulate over that time with one pass of the of the plow so um that I think that notion has to be part of the story and part of the awareness that as we push for more and more pasture and more and more grassland, people understand that it's not a linear system where you can just add and then you, okay, now I'm going to put it back into corn for a while. And, you know, if I only do that for a few years to chase the market, at least I, you know, at least I can come back into it and put it back in pasture if things go bleak again. So I think part of it is education, you know, not to, not to be mealy mouthed about it, but understanding that and what in academic terms we'd call a hysteresis, where it's not linear, you know, um, finding better ways than hysteresis to, <laughs> to, to explain that. But I think people, you know, it's not a, a really complicated concept. Frankly, the policies have to reinforce that long termness of it, right? Like the CRP program did for 10 year chunks of time. Um, but it, man, it has to be longer than 10 years. It has to be more like uh, American Farmland Trust uh, type of approach where you're putting it in a, sorry, what do they call them? Easement. Uh, maybe easement is the, the right term because uh, that might have some baggage attached to it with respect to farming. And uh, so I, I don't have a good answer other than um, part of making the pasture attractive in the first place has to be that the farmer is winning as a result of doing that financially and socially and community wise, et cetera. And that they have to understand that the winning is a long-term buy-in. Part of the conversation we need to have in the learning hubs. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I, I uh, just to follow on from that, one thing that has been interesting is just the, you know, this conversation around putting uh, forestry carbon and uh, ag carbon together and the forestry folks really saying, 
uh, no, we got that. That works, and there's more to be figured out in the on the ag and other working lands. Um, and it kind of has led me to think um, that you know one way to maybe get at some permanence is to really you know the, look at the role for silvopasture, you know, and the benefits that come from that level of perennialization, and like how do we move from not just cover cropping to perennial pasture, but to all the way through to you know integrating tree crops and 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 putting trees back on because those are just physically harder to. Uh, easily remove and may reconsider yep. just how easy it is to pull that up. Um, but I know that that's also a, a big cultural shift to put trees in crop fields. Um, it's maybe something we're not all ready for. But to your point, at, at one o'clock, I have a meeting with a group called Partnering for Perennial Ag that I think uh, Aaron might be on the call or maybe not. But anyway, uh, the idea there is it's, it's folks from agroforestry. It's the Savannah Institute and the Center for Agroforestry it's folks from uh, perennial grains. So that, you know, I was talking at the beginning about articulating a vision in Grassland 2.0 of like, what could the landscape look like? And it's fairly narrow in Grassland 2.0 because we really are hyper-focused on grassland. But the partnering for perennial ag thing is about trying to articulate a, a more, a bigger mosaic that includes silvopasture, agroforestry, perennial grains, and how that all, you know, how that all complements each other. Uh, and that's a that's a more convoluted, harder, harder conversation, but uh, super exciting. I do like I hadn't really thought too much about that, though, Pete, that's good to hear like that concept that like once you're in trees, just sort of conceptually, it's like harder to think of. I'm just going to drag the I'm going to drag the till in there and stir it up for a while. Yeah, so did anyone else have anything they wanted to share really quickly or question before we wrap up? Thanks for the opportunity. Fun. I better get on my partnering for perennial ag call now so sure. I can figure out yeah. how to get those trees out there. Yeah, so thank you everyone for attending and please um, feel free to visit Regain for any for upcoming opportunities, events um, that are related to this, um, and we look forward to talking with you soon.